the book of Job. I'd like to begin with a simple uh, question. Maybe we could call it a quiz. If you're a regular on Wednesday night, you don't have to answer, okay? Somebody's thinking, yeah, this sounds like a setup. Was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was it good or bad? How many of you think it was good? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Now, wh- how could you say it's good? How could you raise your hand and think that the cross of Jesus Christ was good? The Son of God is being crucified on the cross. How is that good? He's naked on a cross. How is that good? Thou shalt not, what? Murder. They're murdering the Son of God. How is that good? Now, if you think the cross of Jesus Christ is bad, raise your hand. What? How can you think it was bad? The cross is the means by which we're saved. The cross is the means by which we know that God truly loves us. While we were what? Yet sinners, Christ died. How can you say the cross was bad? If you think it's both, raise your hand. (laughs) How can you say that? How can you say both and? How can it be both? One or the other? Is that even possible? Now, I'm not done yet with my introduction. How many of you didn't raise your hand at all? Raise your hand. Bok, 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 chicken. How many of you know what a big gulp is? Can I get an amen? You guys remember the, oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven? Right? Big old gulp, the ices, what do they call those? What? Slurpees? Yeah, you slurp too much, you get a brain freeze, right? Y'all know what a Dixie cup is? Yep. The book of Job will help us have a big gulp Christianity and not a Dixie cup Christianity. Okay? So I have a title for the message today. It's When the Righteous Suffer Four Big Gulps. If you would uh, put up with that title. Let's do an overview of the, the book together. If you haven't been with us, this might be a review or first time seeing this. I mean, look how many chapters, 42. By the way, how many of you have ever read through the whole book of Job? Just kind of wave at me. Fantastic. I love it. You are not a normal uh, local church. Praise the Lord. Amen. So there's basically five acts, the prologue, and on the back end, act five, the epilogue. And in the prologue, we have a very um, explicit like obvious, clear as day, uh, portrayal of a doctrine, uh, a theological idea that was very common, not just to the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament, but to every ancient culture that was around the Israelites. And guess what that normal doctrine 101, this is so basic, so normal, is this, that God has a divine counsel, right? God is king. Is he up there all by himself? No, he's not. A king has a court. And so God has chosen to use supernatural beings to help him manage the cosmos. Does God need angels to help him? No, but he has chosen to do so. Does God need you to help him? Amen. But he has chosen to use us feeble creatures, right? And so this is very like uh, uh, apparent in Job 1 and 2. But once you have that divine counsel in the back of your head, wow, you, you get... I would say you get a new Bible. You you start to see it like everywhere where it's not so uh, uh, apparent as well. So there's this prologue here. And and basically, uh, there's a protagonist, the opponent, the adversary. After God says, hey, have you considered? It's like a cosmic staff meeting. Hey, have you considered my servant Job? And basically, the Satan, uh, the adversary. uh, Well, he basically says, well, no wonder he serves you. You got a hedge about him, can't get to him or the things he has, but you take away that hedge and let let me get to what he has, he will curse you to your face. And in the mystery of God's providence, he basically says, game on. 
game on. And so Sabians come, Chaldeans come, and they, they attack and take uh, Job's wealth, which back then, a whole bunch of donkeys, a whole bunch of sheep, right? Okay, and then lightning comes, and then tornado comes and strikes the house where his seven sons are having a massive party for, because it's a birthday party of the eldest son. Tornado comes, strikes the house, and not just the seven sons, but the three precious daughters are there. They all die. They all die. But then it gets worse. There's another dialogue in heaven, and then God allows Satan to attack his body. So he took his wealth, and then he took his health. And the most righteous man on the planet at the time, no greater man than Job, those that come from the east, wisdom comes from the east, he tears his garment, shaves his head, he falls down and he says, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, right? And then usually we stop there or a message will stop there and they won't go into chapter three. And chapter three is where he's really expressing what he's feeling. And he's cursing, he's cursing everything in chapter three. He's cursing the night of his conception, the day of his birth. He's calling upon people who curse things to curse those things. And he's just pouring it out. And uh, two Sundays ago, we saw that. Three friends come, sit with them for about seven days, and they hear all of this outpouring of Job. And the best thing that the three friends did was they said nothing. But now they start to open their mouths in chapter four. Okay, and so we have the dialogue of the three friends. And then there's this young man that kind of pops out of nowhere, Elihu. He speaks, and then God speaks, and then we have the wonderful epilogue where God restores and blesses Job uh, double, okay? So that's an overview. Now, for I have some uh, purposes for this message. There's a meaning to my madness up here for today that the message would increase our understanding, listen, as to the extent of God's sovereignty. You might say, yeah, I know God's ruler. Yeah, I know God's king. Yeah, I know God is God. But what is the extent in your understanding of how far his reign goes? Book of Job will help us. I also pray that the Lord would use this message to increase our love for God and increase our uh, loyalty to God. Okay? I pray that we would uh, better process the evil and suffering in our lives. So on a very personal level, and then also uh, as it relates to the public level as well. Because we all start out with a Dixie Cup understanding of knowing and understanding God. However, the more we read God's word, the more we study God's word, the more we memorize God's word, the more we actually do God's word, obey God's word, you'll come to a more big gulp understanding of God. So, uh, you could write across the entire book of Job, God is sovereign, right? God is sovereign. And in the context of the first two chapters, that means he is sovereign in that he uses supernatural evil, moral evil, and natural uh, evil for his good purposes. Now, this is really weighty, beloved. Stay with me in the intro, okay? This is really weighty because the book of Job answers in is God's answer for why a lot of people are checking out or don't believe God because of evil and suffering, okay? Like the one uh, popular uh, worship leader uh, from, uh, what's the guys from down under? Uh, Australia? Thank you, Hillsong. Yeah, did you read about recently that worship leader from Hillsong? He, he, he's done with God. He has this whole litany of Old Testament questions, right? and he never got good answers, or he got good answers, and he just refused to listen. That happens as well. So a great popular worship leader, now he's done with God. He's done with Jesus. So this is very important that we understand how God is revealing himself in the book of Job. In the book of Job. Now, if you're, if you're this, would be, this is an odd thing for a preacher to say, Put yourself in Satan's shoes. Put yourself in supernatural evil's shoes. If you are a supernatural being and you're intelligent, you want to destroy as many humans as possible. Correct? That's the nature of evil. That's why they're evil. 
They're not good holy angels. So you will want to influence the people that have the most influence on the masses of people. And who or what has the most influence on people on a human level? That would be the government, okay? The government. So intelligent supernatural evil, you better believe that there is spiritual warfare going on as it relates to our government, right? Amen. Uh, so that's why I risk what I say in the pulpit about voting. It impacts on the government level, right? And therefore it impacts our society. So to follow Jesus Christ, we need to get this right and blow up this little personal, just me and Jesus view of Christianity where it's us four and no more. Welcome to the first Baptist of the frozen chosen. You know, we need to have a view of uh, following Jesus Christ that extends up out of these four walls and wherever we go, we're salt and light, salt and light, salt and light. And that includes uh, in the voting booth, okay? So we got supernatural evil, moral evil, and natural evil. Moral evil is what is the bad things that we do to one another or the bad things that we do. That's moral evil. Uh, like, by the way, voting for Democrats. That's morally evil. Bad. Don't do it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, what's natural evil? Natural evil is things like... Uh, raging wildfire, wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes, lightning, and floods. Now, this does not mean the fact that God uses supernatural evil, moral evil, and natural evil. This does not mean we capitulate to evil. Are you following? Well, if, it's, if he uses that, then big deal. No, we don't capitulate to evil. This does not mean we excuse evil. We do not belittle pain and suffering and evil, nor are we going to deny that evil exists like Christian science, which is not Christian nor science, right? But, and it also means that we do not call evil good as to the nature of evil. This does not mean we do not oppose evil. But this does mean, beloved, that God has chosen to use evil for his good purposes. And this is the basis for our victory over our own suffering and losses caused by uh, these evils and allowed by God. This is the foundation to help us process the evil on our personal level and also as we see it on the level of society. And as with every truth about God, right, every line up, every doctrine about God, at the end of that is a cul-de-sac called faith. It's called faith. Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. So let's go to when the righteous suffer for big gulps. Now, because I wanted Chuck to preach his goodbye message and for us to com commend him and Lisa to the Lord uh, last Sunday as they launch into full-time gospel ministry, that means we lost a Sunday in Job. So what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to try to preach from Job chapter 4, to Job chapter 42, verse 6. I'm swinging for the fence. I, I might strike out, but that's what I'm going to try to do today, okay? Now, we could be here too this evening, but uh, no, actually, I have a roast in the crock pot, so we'll wrap up on time. It'll all be good. Huh? Smelled so good this morning. Mm. Now, one Reformed pastor, are you ready for this? He preached for 10 years in the book of Job. Can you imagine church members of First Baptist Church of the Colony listening to me preach for 10 years, right, in the book of Job? All God's people would say, oh, oh my. <laughs> that was Pastor Wally that said, oh my, amen. Imagine messages on what Eliphaz the Temanite said for two years, 102 messages on what Eliphaz the Temanite said. I can imagine a young couple saying to the pastor, can we please get to what friend number two said before our fifth year marriage ceremony anniversary? Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to do that. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll dive right in. So Father, come. Thank you for your presence. Oh Lord, 
draw a straight line with this crooked stick. Come in power. Come. Holy Spirit, manifest. Help us to see you, God, in your glory, your eminence, your resplendent majesty. Help us to see you and help us to further repent of thoughts and words and deeds and motives that are offensive to you, Lord. Thank you for this revelation of your greatness. It boggles our minds. Help me to speak accurately about you. And when I pray for that one that is among us that doesn't know you, God, in a saving way through Jesus Christ, that today would be the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Have mercy on them as you have us. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. Gulp number one. When the righteous suffer, they may have wise friends who do not speak what is right about God and their suffering. This summarizes essentially what the three friends say and what the third young man said as well in chapters 4 to 37. I'm just going to do a broad overview of what they said, and I have an impetus for doing a broad overview of the three friends. Maybe that, preach, that reform preacher that preached for 10 years, maybe he didn't have uh, this impetus, but I, I find it in Job 42.7. So if you have your uh, Bible open to Job, go to Job 42.7 very quickly, or if not, just hear me uh, quote it here. I hear the Bible being turned, so I'll wait. One of my two favorite sounds in the church is what? The pages of the Bible being turned. Amen. You don't, have, you don't see that a lot in local churches. What's the other? The second one? Listening to God's people sing to the Lord. My two favorite sounds in the church. Well, what does Job 42, 7 say? It came about after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, quote, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Whoa. Imagine that. On a surface level, you read over 30 chapters straight through, and at the end, God says everything those three friends just said about me was wrong. <laughs> what a summary. Now, in the, in the context of Job, what does it mean that what they said about God was wrong? All of what the three friends, and perhaps the fourth, he's a little mysterious, uh, all of what they say can be summed up in one phrase. You might want to write this down. Divine justice. Or if you want one word, retribution. That's kind of a long word. Lay that down and scrabble, you won. Amen. Or, if you don't know what retribution is, do you know what the word payback means? Right? Divine justice. So basically, if you obey God, what's going to happen to you? Is it going to be good for you or bad for you, generally speaking? If you're good, good things happen to you. If you disobey God, guess what's going to happen, generally speaking? Bad things going to happen to you. That is generally true, absolutely. The Bible says we reap what we sow, right? Or read Deuteronomy. And God says uh, just that all over the place, right? Blessings for obedience, cursing for disobedience. So in the context of Job, the reason why God says the three friends did not speak what is right of God is because the general doctrine of divine justice or retribution or payback is not always in play when someone suffers, okay? When sickness strikes you or a loved one, are you thinking, God must be punishing me? That's the, that's the, the vibe or the, the normal flow of this, uh, this doctrine of retribution. Remember the man that was born blind? Jesus said, who do you think sinned, his parents or him? Remember that? And what did he say? Neither. But this is so that God would be glorified. Okay? All of us have some health and wealth gospel in us. It's true. Okay, it's true. As much as we are, are not about health and wealth preaching, amen, all of us have some health and wealth gospel in us. Why? Because what's the first thing we do when, when we get sick or when we hear uh, a, 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 about a loved one who's sick? What do we pray? God, would you please heal, <laughs> right? When was the last time you prayed, God, help them to glorify you in their sickness? 
Ooh. Now, here are some examples from each of the three friends. Let's do a walkthrough together. Let's go to Job 4, and let's, let's listen to Eliphaz. Listen to Eliphaz. Uh, let's go to Job 4, 1 through 6, very quickly. And I can summarize what Eliphaz is saying. It's basically this. Hey, Job, practice what you preach. Sounds a lot like Monica, actually. Do you know Monica actually expects me to like, live up to everything that I preach? I'm like, are you serious? I'm not Jesus. I'm just a man. By the way, if you were in the living room counseling us, which side would you be on, Monica's or mine? Monica, raise your hand. Or mine. I'm causing church division. All y'all would be for Monica. Or, or the majority goes for Monica. Amen. Anyways, how did I go off on that? Oh, pra practice what you preach. Yeah. Practice what you preach. Let's cue up. Eliphaz the Timonite, verse 2. If one ventures a word with you, will you become impatient? But who can refrain from speaking? Behold, you have admonished many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? Practice what you preach, Job. Now let's go to Bildad. Everybody say Bildad. Let's go to chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Summary of Bildad is, your words are a blustering wind. You're an airhead, Job. Let's cue him up, Bildad the Shuite. Verse 2, how long will you say these things and the words of your mouth be a mighty wind? Does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert what is right? Look at verse 4. Oh my, I can't believe he's in it. If your sons sinned against him, then he delivered them into the power of their transgression. Ooh. 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 Now, if I was there and he said that to me, I would, abs I would probably deck them. I would bring new meaning to the words laying on of hands, amen. And I might think about praying for forgiveness afterwards. I mean, are you kidding me? Do you see how cutting this is? He's lost seven sons and three daughters. And this Bildad dude is saying, if your son sinned against him, then he delivered them into, he, God delivered them into the power of their trans. Your boys sinned. That's why they died. Verse 5, if you would seek God and implore the compassion of the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely now he would rouse himself for you and restore your righteous estate. Though your beginning was insignificant, your end will increase greatly. Wow. Now let's hear Zophar. Let's go to Job chapter 11. Job 11, 1 through 6. If I could summarize so far in this section here, you know what he's saying? He's saying, God is punishing you less than you actually deserve, Job. Well, these guys are just, they got the gift of encouragement, don't they? They're called Job's what? Friends. How many of you have people like that? You actually like them. I mean, actually, they're, they're acquaintances, maybe even friends, but often is the case that when they're trying to help, their quote help, not really helpful. Can I get an amen, right? Oh boy, yes. Yeah. This is toxic. And what's crazy is, this is actually why the Reformed pastor was in Job for like 10 years, is because a lot of the things that they say about God is technically, theologically correct. The reason why God says what they said is wrong, not right about, what, uh, about God, as Job is, is because they applied that conservative theology, right, of blessing and cursing, disobedience, divine retribution, and they applied it to Job as the answer for why he's suffering. And that was not right. That was not right. Let's go to Zophar. Zophar wishes Job could see himself as God does. Uh, Job 11, verse 1. If you got it, say, I'm there. 
Verse 2, shall a multitude of words go unanswered and a talkative man be acquitted? Who's he talking about? Job. (laughs) Shall your boasts silence men and shall you scoff and none rebuke? For you have said my teaching is pure and I'm innocent in your eyes, but would that God might speak and open his lips against you and show you the secrets of wisdom. For sound wisdom has two sides. Know then that God forgets a part of your iniquity. So here we have number one, when the righteous suffer, they may have wise friends. Notice, wise friends who do not speak what is right about God and their suffering. Now, let's, let's, let's dive into how Job responds in some portions. This leads us to big gulp number two. When the righteous suffer, they can express sarcasm, they can express despair, and they can express faith. Let's look at some sarcasm very quickly. Job chapter 12. You should be close to that, right? Job uh, 12, verse 1 and 2. Then Job responded, <laughs> listen to this, truly then you are the people, <laughs> and with you wisdom will die. <laughs> you know what that's called, beloved? That's called sarcasm. You're the awesome people of the world, and wisdom is going to die when you guys die. That's called sarcasm. Now let's listen to him as it relates to despair. Let's go back to uh, Job 7, Job 7, uh, verse 11. Is it okay that I, I'm in the Bible with you this morning, amen? We're just in the word of God together, amen? Despair, Job 7, verse 11. If you're ready, say I'm ready, all right? Therefore, I will not restrain, this is Job now, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you, he's speaking to God now, that you set a guard over me? If I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me by visions so that my soul would choose suffocation, death, rather than my pains. I waste away. I will not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are but a breath. Can you imagine that? He's speaking to God. This is raw. This is real. And this is why many many people avoid the book of Job. But if we were real and raw, there have been times in our lives has there not, when you can at least identify in some way with this, a sense of despair? Why don't you just leave me alone? Another place he says, why don't you just go leave me alone so I could swallow my spit, my spittle, okay? His brothers, he's in pain, he's hurting, and his three brothers are not helping him at all. They're not speaking what is right of God. Listen to me, beloved. We better know the God of the Bible, so that we can help people in their pain. Amen? Amen. So that we might speak what is right of God. So that we wouldn't freak out when we hear people in pain talk like this about God. There's another portion where he says, you've made me your target. It's like you've, you've gathered your, your widows, you're the divine warrior, you've dipped them in poison, and you let loose your bow. You're using me as your target practice, God. Wow. Leave me alone, verse 16, for my days are but a breath. What is man that you magnify him and that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him every moment? Will you never turn your gaze away from me nor let me alone? There it is. Until I swallow my spittle. Have I sinned? This, this must have been like uh, fingernails on the chalkboard uh, to his friends. Look at this. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? These are stinging, raw, real words. He's not saying in verse 20, any health and wealth preachers out there, when he says, have I sinned? He's not claiming 
uh, sinless perfection, okay? He's not claiming that. In the context of the book of Job, when he asks, have I sinned? He's asking that, is that the reason why all this bad stuff has happened to me? I haven't done anything that would match what has happened to my loss and my pain and my suffering. That's what he's saying. Verse 21. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me, but I will not be. These, <laughs> these are words of despair. These are words of despair. We've looked at sarcasm. Truly then you are the people. Wisdom will die with you, you three stooges. That's, sorry, that wasn't in uh, the Bible, but. Now let's, now let's listen. Let's listen to this man of God. Let's listen to his faith. Let's go to, let's go to Job uh, 16. And then we're gonna get to the best part, I think, of the book in today's message. Listen to him. What did I say? Job 16, verse 19. Just one verse out of verse, uh, chapter 16. Verse 19. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. This is an Old Testament, probably a patriarch. Uh, scholars like to debate the dating of Job. Uh, some say that it's the uh, oldest book in the Bible. Others say, it's no, it's late. It's post-exilic. I happen to be on the side of, I think it's the oldest book in the Bible. But how is he speaking of a advocate in heaven or a witness on high there in verse 19? Now, as Christians looking back, I'm saying that's Jesus right there. Amen. I'm saying that's Jesus and if you're not convinced with Job 16, 19, then maybe you will in Job 19, verses 25 to 29. Let's go to Job 19. Job 19. Oh, these are words of great faith. Job 19, 25. If you're there, say I'm there. All right. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another, my heart faints within me. Isn't that a beautiful declaration of faith in the midst of his pain, his suffering, and his loss? Would to God that we would be like Job. It's okay if you squeak out some sarcasm in your pain and suffering. Go ahead, squeak it out. Job did. There's nobody like him on planet Earth, according to the lips of God. He used sarcasm. <laughs> and it's okay to express words of despair and discouragement and depression and to uh, not mask it, to embrace those feelings and vent to the Lord. You know, there's a debate. Let me ask you this as a, a church body. Do you think it's okay for God's people to question God? How many of you, I mean, this is sincere. It's not the silly question at the beginning. How many of you think it's okay to question God, to God? Raise your hand. I'm just curious. Nothing, nothing funny. How many of you are on the side of, you know what? God is God, and no, no, you should never question God. Raise your hand. Okay, just a few of you. Maybe we should do, can we do both and? I don't know. Let's go to big gulp number three. When the righteous suffer, God will speak to them through the storm. Let's, uh, let's go to Job 38. Everybody's talking in the book of Job. Talk, 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 talk. That fourth younger man, he's not even acknowledged by anybody in the book of Job. Job doesn't respond to him. The three friends don't respond to him. And uh, God does not even respond to him. That being Elihu. Now, I think one of the highlights 
of the book is found in chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job. How did he answer him, beloved? Out of what? Out of the whirlwind. Bible way of saying tornado. What killed his kids? What killed his kids? The wind. Tornado. And when God finally speaks, look at what he's speaking out of. The very thing that killed his children. Mm. For me, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Verses 1 through 7 can be seen as a summary of chapters 38 to 41. So let's, let's look at verses 1 through 7. And you tell me when I read this, you tell me what the vibe is from the Lord. Is it happy? Is it light? Or is it pretty heavy? You ready? Here we go. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Let me, let me stop here for a second. The, in the paradoxical ways of God, most likely, the greatest amount of pain and suffering and even evil that's been done to you God uses that to reveal himself in a way like no other. You following? When we hear testimonies of our brothers and sisters being born again, is the testimony normally, you know, everything was just going great in my life and God was just blessing me and I really didn't believe in him, but things were going so great in my life, I decided to follow Jesus Christ. Is that the way it normally goes? No, it's not. Suffering in God's paradoxical ways is where he reveals himself the most. And we can make a beeline to the cross of Jesus right now. The greatest revelation of God is not in a sunset, it's not in the highest of heavens, it's on a cross. That's the greatest revelation of God. Evil, pain, suffering. Isn't that mysterious? It's like God takes the, the human, God takes human wisdom and he stands it on its head and he shakes omnipotent heart. He just shakes. He undoes human wisdom. He undoes human, uh, human wisdom. All right, verse one. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens uh, counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who said its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Look at this. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Are you feeling a little heat in the, uh, in the words of God here? Oh yeah. I can imagine Job saying, uh-oh. Oh, by the way, look at the, the synonymous parallelism in, in verse seven. Morning stars are associated with angelic beings. Who's the angelic beings? Well, according to the Old Testament, one term for them is sons of God. And notice that it says, how many of the sons of God shouted for joy? It was as if they had a front row seat to creation, right? And so God speaks. Sorry about that. God speaks. And how many of the sons of God shouted for joy? All. I think all means what? All. So at the creation, I'm saying based on verse seven, all the sons of God means all the sons of God at creation. And so when we see this, this, uh, this figure, this snake figure, which to the ancient world, this is also basic, normal, duh, everybody knows this. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, divine beings were often depicted as snakes. So there you have it. So what I would argue that in Genesis 3, uh, when we see the fall of uh, not just Adam and Eve, I think we see the fall of the Satan, uh, Satan, the devil, and Adam and Eve at the same time, at the same time. And my little evidence for that is verse 7 of Job 38. All the sons of God were together and shouting for joy. 
Now, there's some more zingers that I'd like to uh, highlight, but our time is running out, so let me just give you a, a few. In fact, let's go to verse uh, 35. Verse 35. So all of these questions, I counted all of them. How many? Yeah, I counted, I could be wrong, but I counted 64 questions from God to Job. 64 questions. And guess what? They're all about creation. They're all about creation. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning? That's verse 12. Verse 16, have you ever entered the springs of the sea or walked into the recesses of the deep? Have, have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. And I asked you to highlight verse 35. It's one of my favorite in the book. Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. It's like a soldier. Where do you want me to go? He's talking about lightning bolts. Stay with me. I thought lightning bolts and lightning strikes were the most random thing that happens on the earth. Don't you think that way normally? Not according to the Bible. Every lightning strike goes exactly where God tells them to go. Amen. Oh, amen. This is a great God, this God of the Bible. I used to think growing up in church that the, that the grass just grew naturally. Oh, no. The psalmist says he causes the grass to go, grow. So whether it's grass whether it's a sparrow that doesn't fall apart from your father, as Jesus says, or a lightning. What's the implication of all these nature questions? Here's some more zingers real quick. Let's see here. Uh, do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Who set out the wild donkey free? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high, Job? All these nature questions. Here's another zinger out of, this is coming from Job 39.2. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Ooh. Verse 8 of Job 39. Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Ooh. Or do you have an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? That's verse nine of Job 39. I find that very interesting because God's speaking about himself in the third person. Why would he do that? It's probably because Jesus is talking about his father or God's talking about his son. Do you have an arm like God that you can thunder with a voice like his? Chapter 40, Verse six, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? All right? God speaks to us through the storm. He speaks to us very clearly through the storm. And he's sovereign. He's good. He's great. And although it is, it, not although, it is right for us to say that which is evil in nature, to call it evil. Amen. But yet we must also affirm that God uses evil for his good and great purposes. And I love a God like that. I love a God like that. Because there's been pain and suffering in my life. And there's been pain and suffering in your all's lives. And I'm here to tell you, it is not gratuitous. That is without any meaning. Our God is so great and so good. He has chosen to use evil and suffering, not only for his own glory, but for our good. And we see this ultimately in the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, I struggle as a pastor sometimes when it comes to the sanctity of life because I want to be on the front end and say, no, no, a thousand times, no. It's evil. No. And it's right for us to do so, privately and publicly, unashamedly, 
Amen. And yet at the same time, I have a heart for those that have had an abortion. And I struggle because I want them to hear the no, but yet I know when I'm saying no strongly, what about that one that's had an abortion? How do they hear that? So I want to yell out, amen, you can be forgiven. You can be healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. This thought came to me before I had to look the Lord's Supper today. My sin caused the death of the Son of God. My sin, our sin, your sin caused the death of the Son of God. There better be no, in this church, there better be no condemnation, no second class members when you find word that one among us has had an abortion, amen. And if there is, get up out of here and go somewhere else. This should be a place of healing. This should be, this should be a safe place, amen. And I find largely that it is, that it is. One more big gulp and then we're done. How are we doing on time? How's the roast, Monica? We all right? One more gulp, please. When the righteous suffer, they should affirm God's sovereignty and rest in his reign. Everybody's talking in the book of Job. Talk, 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 talk. Three friends are talking. Fourth friend talks. He's not even, he's not even addressed by anybody. He's the young one. Some scholars say it's because he's the young one. Whatever. Others see him as a bridge from the three friends to God's speech. It's interesting. You should read and study yourself. When the righteous suffer, they should affirm God's sovereignty and rest in his reign. Pick up with me uh, Job 42, quickly verses one through six. God finally speaks. And oddly enough, it's all these nature questions. What? I'm asking you, Job would, would say, I'm asking you, God, for a reason for my suffering, and you're asking me about where donkeys go in the springtime to give birth? Are you, what? No, I wasn't around when the sons of God shouted for joy. But with each question, Job gets it. He, he's, he's starting to, not he's starting, at the end of God's speeches, Job gets exactly what God is speaking to him. If you don't even know how, or where donkeys go to give birth in the springtime or things about the heavens and on earth and the seas, if you don't even know how to run creation, who are you to question me about how I run my moral universe as well? Pick up verse one of Job 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. Stop right there. Would to God that every Christian believed that. You would be a lot less stressful if you really believe what Job said in verse two, amen. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Amen, Job. And it's as if he quotes God. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, back to Job, I have declared that which I did not understand, two things wonderful for me which I did not know. Here now and I will speak, I will ask you, and you instruct me. It's as if he's uh, echoing God again, or it's God saying that. And then back to Job, verse five, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract, I repent in dust and ashes. Here comes the, knucklehead health and wealth preachers. See, see, he repented. See, see, he repented of the sin that caused it. No, he's repenting of the, the demand for an answer for his pain and suffering. God never gives it to him. God never gives him a reason, beloved. He gives him something better and that which satisfied Joel, uh, Job and it was a revelation of himself that he had never had before. Job was wise the greatest theologian of his day, and yet he got more out of God from, from the suffering that he had not had before.
This theology is seen in the preaching of the early church in the book of Acts. Have you ever listened to the church pray in Acts 4, 27? Regarding the crucifixion of Christ, it says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Who's responsible for the death of Jesus Christ on the cross? According to that verse, Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and whomever, the peoples of Israel. Right? The bad guys got him. Oh, but wait. At the Last Supper, the Lord gave some bread to the betrayer. He gave the bread to whom? Judas. Right? And what you do, do quickly. So here we go. I'm bookending the message. Supernatural evil and moral evil, right? And then natural evil. Supernatural evil was working through the government, the, the religious elite, through uh, Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel. And yet here, to do what? To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. It's very similar to the Sabians, the Chaldeans, lightning, and the tornado. There is an overarching will in the universe that is ultimate, and that will is God. Now as I close, the problem of evil and suffering was brought to Jesus in only one place in all of the four gospels that I know of. That's Luke 13. And it says, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. That's called natural evil. People worshiping in the courts and Pilate orders them to be slaughtered. That's moral evil. And they brought this problem this, uh, to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? Divine retribution, they were bad people. Those worshipers were, so that bad death happened to them. Jesus is bringing it up, right? He says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he extends the discussion to include natural evil. Or do you suppose that they, those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed uh, them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish perish what kind of an answer is that like he bypasses it god what about this natural evil that's happening these tornadoes and fires and hurricanes and all that bad stuff and what about all the moral stuff that we see in the universe god, give me an answer the answer from the son of god is repent or you're all gonna die wow so that's how i like to close the message let us repent let us repent, perhaps of speaking ill or wrong of God concerning evil and suffering. Maybe you want to have this God as your father who is so great and so good that he sent his only son to die on behalf of sinners. That's why there's a church here. I like to say if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. Amen. Right? Right? It's okay, we'll take another hypocrite, amen. I'm just, I'm teasing, not justifying hypocrisy. I don't like church because I've been hurt by the church. Really? Let's sit down and talk. I got some stories for you. I'm not talking to you about church, I'm talking about a relationship with God. It's only through Jesus Christ. And he is so great and so good he has promised to work out everything for our good. It's a utility. It's a using of the evil and suffering. That's a God worth knowing. It's a God worth loving. It's a God worth trusting and depending on. It's a God worth serving.